to Lizzie. Hi, everybody. Welcome to class number two of our How to Cross Stitch and Do Basic Embroidery class for, for class series. It is so fun to be back. I see a lot of repeat names. We are so happy to have you. Uh, thanks for coming back for class number two. I hope, oh, I just have a notification we're being recorded. I'm going to press continue so I can see your chat. It was right in the, <laughs> right in the middle of the chat. Um, I just want to say welcome and I want to say thank you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for coming back and participating with us again. Um, last week, if you missed last week's class, that's a okay. First of all, you can go to michaels.com slash classes or Michael's YouTube channel and watch the replay of class number one if you missed it. We went over sort of what cross stitch, what cross stitching is and all the materials you need for it. It's a true beginner class, a true how to cross stitch for somebody who's never ever done it before. So for those of you who are cross stitchers already, thank you for your patience as we kind of went into everything and uh, got our newbies up to speed so that we can all keep stitching together in a, a more advanced way, uh, classes two, three, and four. So michaels.com slash classes or Michael's YouTube channel, you can rewatch last week's class number one. After that, a few days ago, I recorded myself stitching the uh, the door element of our pattern uh, just to kind of get a little bit ahead of it and so we could work on some of the character elements today. So you can find that on Stitch People's YouTube channel. So if you go to youtube.com slash Stitch People, you can find a little bonus stitch along video uh, that catches you up to speed to this point of our pattern. This is the little front door to 221 B Baker Street for Sherlock Holmes and John Watson. Uh, and it's just like a camera overview with me explaining how to do a bunch of this. And I saw somebody ask a question about those half stitches. We will go over that today. We'll uh, stitch one of those lanterns and talk about those half stitches. Or actually, I guess, I guess we'll go over, uh, my plan is to do Watson and he has some half stitches too. So we'll talk about it there. Um, for those of you who are watching this video on replay, welcome. Thank you for... Uh, future you watching past us uh, do this class. Uh, if, if you don't have the pattern, you future watching people, you can go to uh, stitchpeople.com slash Michaels, and that will get you access to our Sherlock Holmes and John Watson pattern. I'll show you that here on my uh, camera. We've got this this pattern you can get at stitchpeople.com slash Michaels, as well as a list of materials that are useful to you for uh, cross stitching and specifically for completing this pattern here. So that is stitchpeople.com slash Michaels. And I have to say, I'm so thrilled. I was on Instagram a bunch this week, probably too much because that's the kind of person I am. And I saw some progress photos of all of you, uh, some of you posting, working on the pattern, which just thrilled me to the core. So if any of you are tackling this pattern, please feel free to post progress photos of it. We'd love to see you and cheer you on and put on our, our digital foam fingers, if you will, and be your A number one fan. So if you post to social media about doing this pattern or about watching this class, we'd love to see you and interact with you. So um, the best way we can find you is if you use three hashtags that all have to do with this class. So they should be easy to remember. The first one is hashtag make it with Michaels. It's a Michaels class, so hashtag make it with Michaels. If you use the second hashtag, hashtag DMC, uh, because they're the ones uh, behind this today. And then if you use the hashtag stitch people, that's the way we can find your progress photos of this pattern. And I just love to see it because it just thrills me. I, I love uh, I love everybody just plugging away at it. It's kind of fun to think about. I get really philosophical real quick. And it's just fun for me to think about people all over the country and all over the world uh, kind of working on the same little the same little pattern all together. There's just something comforting to me about it might only be a few hundred of us across the world, but hey, that's that's kind of cool. Just weaving a little web of interconnectivity. So give us a chance to cheer you on. I'd love to see it. Um, and then if you haven't signed up for the third and fourth class, please do. We'd love to have you back. Uh, it's fun to see in the chats. It's fun to interact with you. And pretty much from here on out, we're just going to be stitch, stitch, stitching. So it'll be a lot of fun. Um, so if you go to stitchpeople.com slash week three, the number three, and stitchpeople.com slash week four, you can get signed up for the next classes and get the reminders and uh, keep an eye on our social media as I do a few more little um, bonus videos. I haven't decided if I'm gonna do more, but I might. So that's why I say keep, it, keep an eye. So without further ado, oh, Cynthia says she puts her photos on Facebook. That's great, Cynthia, we'll check them out. Um, and then Yona asked, oh, this is a great question to kind of get us into stitching for the day. So let me switch to my stitch camera. 
transition here. So Yona said that her embroidery or her Ada cloth is splitting from the pointy needle. Why is that happening? Um, Yona, that I would say, just make sure that you're using the point of the needle as precisely as possible to really aim it inside the holes of the fabric. It will split if you uh, poke it in between the threads of the fabric, that will cause the splitting. So if you just uh, really start to practice and uh, hone, focus on your hand-eye coordination just to guide the very tippy tip of the needle into the hole of the fabric, center of the fabric, um, that would be great. I'm gonna preempt because I know sometimes people experience this sort of splitting effect, splitting feel of their embroidery floss threads as well. And that just, that'll get easier with practice. Um, using your needle to sort of push the existing stitches threads aside so that you can slide the needle down next to existing stitches instead of through existing stitches. Because with cross stitching, as you can see, um, many, if, if you have a full up pattern like this, many of the cross stitches share the same hole. Any given um, hole of the Ada fabric in this door has four separate stitches going through it. So one hole in the center with the four corners all around it sharing that same hole, right? So it can get pretty crowded in the holes of the Ada fabric. So you just wanna make sure that with your needle, you're, you're using that needle as more than just a poker, as more than just a thread, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Transition device, a thread moving device. It, it's its own tool. So if you use the tip of the needle to sort of scooch stitches as you push the needle through, um, then, then you'll make sure that your needle is sliding past existing stitches and through the center of the hole instead of through existing stitches threads, through the threads of the Ada fabric and getting a little bit split. That's a really good question, Yona. Thank you for asking. Um, if anybody else has any questions in here, please feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, my husband, Spencer here, who is a kind of co-founder of Stitch People and my right-hand man, here he is. He's on a computer four feet away, uh, keeping track of the chats. So you might hear his voice come through my microphone as he tells me, um, as he tells me what your questions are. So Susan asks, uh, could you show me how to transition from one row to the next? Yes, the short answer to that, Susan, is however you can. Honestly, that's one thing where I, I really believe that there is huge value in sort of following the rules of any traditional craft of any kind, um, doing things the way it's been done because people have typically been doing things like this for centuries. They've got a pretty good method, you know, figuring it out. But um, at the end of the day, I'm a big believer in making it work however you need. Uh, even if you feel it's breaking rules or if you're not sure, uh, let your own imagination and creativity help you solve problems so that you can keep going and you can feel empowered to keep tackling projects and not let uh, the fear of not knowing like the right way to do it get you along. Now, I'm not saying you're like afraid. <laughs> I'll, I'll show you how to do rows. It's pretty simple. Um, but but the short answer to that is, and I just want to encourage everyone uh, to, to do things your way that works for you, that makes sense to you. And if you're doing something and there's no real logical way to make the next thing happen, okay, then it's not logical and you just make it happen. I hope that makes sense. Uh, we'll, we'll go over there. Um, so we'll answer more questions as we go along today. Um, so as I mentioned, I did an extra bonus stitch along uh, to just show the process of cross stitching. We're gonna go over some more of these half stitches and more cross stitching as we go. I thought it would be fun today to uh, talk about uh, straight stitching and more cross stitching. So I'm gonna start with straight stitching the details of this door. So the door I only completed the black and gold cross stitching and the sort of beige stair and arch base. But in the pattern, you can see there are uh, some details. This printed pattern is a little dark, but there's some gray details here that I wanna go over today because this is a really basic stitch, straight stitching. It's just in and out, in and out, donezo. You don't even have to cross anything. And yet it adds details to your portraits, if you're doing a Stitch People portrait like this, or your cross stitch projects at large, that just kind of bring out some, some dimension. So I'm going to be using DMC 645. I like to take a length between my forefinger and thumb, go to my elbow or my bicep is generally a really good workable length. It's long enough to help you make a significant impact on your pattern, but short enough that it's not unruly to work with. Now with these door details, I'm going to use two strands of thread. With size 14 Ada fabric, I generally like to use three strands of floss. And uh, somebody asked about using three strands. It can be tricky to work with. Um, 
I hate to say that just practice over time, you get used to working with it and the nuance of it, um, untwisting it, you know, all of that. But today I'm gonna just take two threads of this six strand floss. I'm gonna pull that apart slowly and try and do this as quickly and as <laughs> gracefully as I can. Usually I, I will use my mouth for that third end there, but I want you to be able to see. Okay, and I'm gonna thread my needle with this. Just get the ends wet here. I am not graceful about that. And then we thread it and go. So with the straight stitching, I'm just going to kind of knock it out and show you how I do that. I'm gonna start in this bottom left corner. And because these are, I'm gonna, I'm gonna complete these as single long strands so that they stand out from the door as opposed to a running stitch the length of this straight um, pattern here. I have a line and I could stitch, 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 stitch up the Ada fabric. I'm just gonna do long, long single straight stitches. You'll see why it gives it a nice three-dimensional look. However, with that said, because the stitches are going to be long, it's gonna be hard, it's gonna take a while to create loops for my tail to get secure. So a little trick I like to do when I've already got stitching on my project completed, I have tons completed here from this door, I like to pre-secure my floss uh, so that I don't have to worry about catching the tail after the fact. So what I do with my uh, floss and needle threaded is I'll just pull my needle through some of the stitching along the back side, uh, and I'll just loop it around itself and pull it through a couple times. So I leave a tiny little tail and I'll pull it through some, of, some more stitching. Uh, would you talk about why you're using two strands for this particular detail and not three like normal? Oh yes, I lost my train of thought on that. I'm using two strands uh, just because I don't want the thickness of the thread to overwhelm the door. I want to allude to the little uh, molding or pattern of the door, but I don't want it to uh, feel chunky or be distracting from, because the gold details here are cross-stitched, they lay really flat. And since this stitching is going on top of the cross-stitching, Three threads to me is just a little chunky. If you like that bold look though, go for it. And if you want it even more delicate and want to just use one strand, go for it. I'm using two because this is a dark gray. So I want enough thickness that it shows up against the black, but not so much thickness that it's distracting from the gold elements as well. So I've looped my floss and, uh, and needle around some of the back stitching. I did three loops and now you can see that it is secure. So I don't have to worry about a tail. I don't have to worry about holding it with my finger. It just takes the pressure off to get started, especially on long straight stitches like this. So for this door detail, you'll be surprised I think by how quickly this goes. I'm gonna bring my needle up in the square that's indicated on the pattern, the bottom left corner of this initial detail. And on my pattern, I go up one, two, three, four, five, six. So on my, oh, I'm out of frame here. So on here, I'm gonna go up one, two, three, four, five, six, and just put this back through my fabric. And we are there. Spence, could you zoom in me a little bit here? On my pattern, I'm gonna go over to the right, one, two, three, four. So one, two, three, four. We're gonna go on top of the letter opener here ever so slightly. And go back over to the corner. And then in the pattern, we start under the letter opener and come down one, two, three, four. So we start under the letter opener and come down. Oh, I got a knot. Does this happen to you guys? Happens to me all the stinking time. It, here's pro tip. Whenever this happens, remind yourself, it's a loop, not a knot. That's all, it's just a loop. It's just a floss looping around itself. Don't freak out. So what I find is if I can just catch these loops with my needle and if I don't freak out and if I'm just patient and kind of tug at all of the strands here. Oh look, I found a place where it's gonna give and it's free, just a little loop. Don't freak out. <laughs> I used to freak out and it often would make it into a real knot. It would make it worse. Um, so now I'm gonna come down here. The black is a little hard to see through on this distance. So apologies for 
leaning out of frame. And then I'm just gonna finish this door molding. Ta-da, left side done. And we have this really great look of the door. I don't know what this is. is there, if somebody knows what this is called in the chat, the doors panel? panel, yeah, panel sounds right. I should know this door panels. Cynthia's nodding her head. Yeah, she's like, yes, it's a panel. Thank you. Okay, so now I'm going to go over and do, it's funny when you're on the spot, things just fall out of my brain. I probably couldn't even tell you my own name. Okay, so now I'm going to look at actually double check my pattern for the bottom right. We just have one space of door between these panels. So I'm going to, forgive me, I just need to look close. I wish I had eagle vision. I looped again, you guys. Today is the day of teaching you all about floss looping. This is why I like the length of floss that I use up to my bicep or elbow, because the longer your floss is, the more likely that is gonna happen, just because there's more floss running next to itself as you stitch. It's just increases the likelihood greatly. Are there any ways to decrease? That yes, likelihood? that's a really great question. Some people, when they are separating their strands, like to separate all the strands and then put the number back together that they need. So instead of just splitting the six strands into say two groups of three, they'll take each of the six strands out. They'll have six separate threads and then they'll recombine. And that you can kind of create your own twist that of floss so that it lays a little more flat. Sometimes too, let me finish this um, panel here at the bottom and see if I can show you an example of what I mean. Sometimes as you're stitching, just in the course of stitching, like right now, I felt my needle kind of shift. I don't know if you can see it because we're close up, but I felt it just sort of shift a little in my hand. It just rolls as you go, which causes the floss to twist ever so slightly as you're going. And once you've done 20, 30 stitches with 20, 30 little micro rotations of your needle, all of a sudden your floss might be a little twisted and, and it's nobody's fault. It's not even your fault. It's just sort of physics, I guess, just things twist, things shift, things go. Um, if that happens, a really great way to fix it is to hold, um, I'm gonna just zoom out here so you can see a little better. If you hold your project up and you let your needle drop, uh, we'll do that. And you let your needle drop, your floss will sort of hang and naturally untwist itself. And you just give it a little shake, it'll untwist nicely and you can pick that baby up and just keep going. So that's another way to sort of prevent, um, prevent twisting. Uh, for everyone, I I'm trying to get good lighting. Part of it's just the quality that Zoom uh, broadcasts at, that it, we're not Zoom. able to see like the gray against the black. Oh, is it? Uh... Yeah, it's hard to see. Which to be honest with you, that is a perfect example of why for this particular detail, um, because a black door, with panels, the panels are also black. Technically, they're not really gray. So that's why I chose a dark gray because in real life, it would just be black paint and it would just be the actual 3D dimensions of the door itself that gives it the panel look. And we can see that with our eyeballs because of eyeballs and the light and whatever. That's why I chose a dark gray. And this is why I like for this particular usage, the long straight stitches just all the way up, all the way over, all the way down, because that allows the light to catch this, these dark swaths and give it a little bit of shine and look more real um, because running stitches within the cross stitches there that exist would get a little bit lost and it wouldn't catch the light in the same way. So there's, there's my trick. So now I'm gonna go up and use the, um, the next panel, which I have to admit, uh, some of you may have noticed, the middle right panel got a little funky in uh, in the pattern. I didn't catch it before we published it. So I apologize. The point is to make this panel, this middle right panel look just like the left one. What's happening? Oh, yes. You wanna make this uh, middle right panel look like the left one. There's a missing, a missing, um, this goes down a little too long and we're missing a thing here. That was just my bad as I was exporting this pattern. So what I'm gonna do is actually, I'll do the left one so that you can see, see what I'm up to. Where, where's the best place for that? I want you to see the pattern too while I'm working. Great, there we go. 
So I'm just going to hop over and do the left panel, even though it's a little wasteful of floss. Not not logistically super great, but that's okay. I'd rather you see it and then I'll be able to envision the right side a little more easily. So just making straight stitches. Spencer, any questions I can answer while we're just making these door, door panels happen? I feel so yeah. empowered now that yeah. I remember the word panel. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> door panel, 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 panel. Oh boy. Uh, someone asks about uh, what if you stitch something that you're not happy with? Oh, that is so common. <laughs> and it's just the worst. So if you catch it in real time. Would you repeat the question? Yes. Okay. In case you're quiet. So somebody asks, what happens if you stitch something that you're unhappy with? That's a great question. So if it happens in real time, and I just realized, I literally just, this is perfect. I don't know if you guys can see that very well, but I, uh, I didn't start this bottom one in the correct spot. So I'm at, at a diagonal here. This is just an honest mistake. I just miss, mistook the holes in my fabric. So if you catch it in real time, like I just did, what I can do is I'm just gonna look at the back and feed my needle back the way it came. Ta-da, we undid that stitch. And I'm because I started down here, what I can actually do is like unstitch this entire thing. This really only works if you're confident that you've been very careful about getting your floss next to each other in the holes in the Ada fabric and you're not running the point of your needle through existing stitches. Because if you're trying to push your needle back the opposite direction and kind of retrace your steps and you're catching thread, you're gonna get all tangled. The other option is to pull your needle out and use it as a tool. I'm gonna just put my needle under the existing stitch to undo it and to undo this one so that I can get back to the beginning. Because I caught this pretty early, this is why I'm going all the way back to the beginning. Had I caught this a little later, I probably would have just done one little more stitch here and lived with it, lived with the mistake. Um, if you have to undo an entire section, I actually recommend a seam ripper because you can slide it really carefully under the cross stitches, even on the front of your fabric, which is actually what I recommend. And you just brrrp, and undo them all. And uh, you can kind of pick through from the back and pull all those threads through and, uh, and redo it. So a seam ripper can be helpful. And sometimes, what? I was gonna say, found at michaels.com. Yeah, found at michaels.com. Uh, or any Michaels near you. Uh, let's see, I wanna make sure I'm doing this right now. I'm freaking out. Okay, now I know I'm in the right hole and I can retrace my steps accordingly. Uh, sometimes, and I will just say this and give you the confidence in the permission you might need to choose this. Sometimes you just start over. Sometimes you get deep enough into a thing and you look back and you realize you've made a mistake and there's no easy way to fix it and it stinks and you should have some ice cream or something on hand to make yourself feel better after weeping over the, the wasted time and the dashed dreams. It's not wasted. It's not wasted, it's good practice time. Leave it to Spencer for a silver lining. You'll feel very dejected, but you can just start <laughs> over. Okay, I'm so sorry. I'm just want to make sure I'm getting right in the holes here. Stitching at this funny angle is sometimes tricky. So now I fix this and the panel is gonna go in the correct place. And I just need to go over one square. I'm gonna stop at the door handle because I don't want to distract from that. Uh, while you're doing that, yeah. Cynthia had a great question. Can I make different people on either side of the door? Oh my gosh, yes, Cynthia. Do whatever the heck you want. If you have uh, something like the Stitch People book, we have tons and tons of different clothing styles and hairstyles and patterns in there for you to reference. Um, literally, the whole point of that book is to make customization as easy as possible and take as little work off of your plate as possible. So um, it... Uh, <laughs> While it is promotion of my own product, it's I, I, I made the product to like serve you. So if you have that book, whip it out, make yourself, make your friends, do whatever the heck you want. Um, absolutely, yes, I love that. I love that with Cynthia. Mm -hmm. Yay, Cynthia, high five, Cynthia. <laughs> I think that's great. So now I'm going to come over here. Oh, see, it's so hard to stitch at this funny angle. There I did, so I'm just retracing my steps because I missed the row. 
Hopefully this is giving you beginner's confidence that you can mess up even after you've been stitching for years and years and years, and it's totally okay. That is the wrong hole as well. Going back. Come on. And my needle just came unthreaded. You guys, this is apparently, apparently fate or whatever it is you believe in wanted me to teach you about dealing with mistakes in real time today. Cause that seems to be precisely what's happening to me. So my needle came unthreaded. I'm just re-threading it. That's all frustrating, but easy fix. Um, if you stick your needle in the wrong hole, uh, just pull it back out, undo the stitch, fix it, easy fix. Um, little things, little things to fix that ultimately aren't gonna be the end of the world. They are frustrating, but it happens to everyone. So fear not. And then this one goes, just checking my pattern. There is only one row of space above this final set of panels. And then we'll have these really cool door details. And the reason I wanted to lead with this today is because for those of you who are cross stitchers, who, who consider yourself a cross stitcher, um, you might feel yourself feeling a little nervous about jumping into embroidery. I know I've spoken with a lot of cross stitchers who feel like, well, you know, I really have cross stitching down, but embroidery makes me nervous. Um, very technically speaking, we're doing embroidery right now. These are big, long, straight stitches. We're doing it. You're doing it. You're already doing the thing. Nothing to be worried about. Uh, and, and I just always want you, Cynthia clearly is already, has her creative, customizey brain and gear. As you're thinking about how to customize your patterns and play with them, make your own or make adjustments to patterns that you have, um, don't be afraid to think about the simple stitches too, because I hope you can see even in this dark light, the way the light is catching these long straight stitches, you can see, oh, it's like panels recessed in the door and it, it kind of works, right? So it, this is just because of straight stitches. So feel free to utilize stitches, both great and small or simple stitches in a great way. And, um, and you'll be kind of amazed at, at the impact it can have. Generally speaking, now as you're talking, someone pointed out that uh, the stairs that you've done are a little different from the pattern. Um, oh yes, I, <laughs> I had a hard time seeing <laughs> through my own pattern. <laughs> um, so I accidentally, they're, they're each just a square too wide. Well, not two, but just a square wider than the pattern shows. Um, that's all. But, but the thought is, who cares? Yep, I, I did that. And then I realized like, well, looking at the pattern, the, the ferns are going to be kind of over them anyway, which will cover it up a little bit. It doesn't look bad. It's just different than the pattern shows. So it's not like wrong. It's just wider stairs than before. <laughs> and that's, yeah. that's one thing about stitch people. I love that you noticed that. <laughs> of course. <laughs> one thing about stitch people is that it's a starting point. Yeah. You're the one creating this art. Mm -hmm. You're the one yeah. doing the work. You so want you wide stairs? You want. Make wide stairs. You want cats on either side of the door? Stitch cats. Why not? I say do like a cute little like cat Sherlock Holmes with a pipe. Someone says mm -hmm. the stairs are wider so Sherlock and John can get out of the door faster. Yes, to solve exactly. To solve crimes. I love that. Okay, so that's it for the door. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Uh, and you can see, I think maybe if we zoom out, the light might change a little, but that's how the panels show up. It's just a nice trick of the trick of the light is what we're going for. Now I'm going to use this exact same floss color, which is 645 listed here on the pattern, there on the pattern. Um, We've used it for the door details, and now we're going to use it for Watson's suit and hat. I tend to build, uh, this is a stitch people specific thing, but it's with patterns too. I tend to build that patterns or elements of patterns from bottom to top. If I can figure out where the bottom starts and kind of get that in place, I can build everything else on top of that. That's just how I do it. If you're a top down, left to right, whatever you want. Um, but I'm going to start bottom up today. We should talk about how to finish a color. Oh yes. We, we actually didn't cover that. We time. didn't, did we? It's the very first thing in the video, <laughs> Stitch People's YouTube channel. Um, let me get my three strands for Watson suit. So we used two for the door. So I have four left. So I'm just gonna remove one, uh, one little strand. So now I have my uh, three strands for size 14 Ada fabric. And I'm going to count on my pattern. Make sure you can see that. So from what's a good anchor? 
A good anchor point visually is this, uh, the bottom line of this right panel. So if I follow that to the edge of the door, I just need to go up one hole and over one hole in the Ada fabric. And that's the bottom left hole of John Watson's suit stitch there. So translating that, I, that's kind of how I navigate my way around patterns. I look for landmarks from which I can count, again, counted cross stitch, uh, from which I can count my pattern out. So if I go, uh, the idea was, you can see that, perfect. So for my bottom panel, I take that bottom panel to the edge of the door, that's right where my needle is. And then I go up one hole and over one hole from that. And that is my bottom left corner of Watson's suit. Now, before I start stitching, I'm gonna look closely at what I've already done and make sure that as I start, the bottom diagonals of my John Watson cross stitches are going to match all of the cross stitches I've already done. So my bottom diagonals go bottom left to top right. So I'm just gonna start stitching where I am. And this suit only has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and a half, well, 11 technically, uh, stitches. So I'll bust this out really quick and we'll talk about how to end a color when you're done. So when you're starting, like we talked about last week, uh, I prefer to do it without any knots so that if you frame this, it's not super chunky. And as you work, there's no um, threat of those knots pulling through. So I leave a tail that I hold down with my finger as I stitch. Make sure you can see okay, there we go. So now I'm going to complete John Watson's suit and I'm gonna do uh, his suit in rows because that's just my personal preference for stitching. You can either stitch cross stitches individually or in rows where you do all the unders and then all the overs. And now uh, for this first stitch, I've just flipped over my work so that as I pull this first stitch through and it makes a loop, I'm going to make sure that loop catches my, uh oh catches my tail, which was caught and then popped free. Come back, come back, you little tail. Okay, and now tail caught, we are secured and ready for takeoff. So now the John Watson pattern, I'm gonna do one, two, three diagonals, skip two, one, two, three diagonals and work my way back and just bust that out really quick. So for those of you who didn't see last week's class or the YouTube video, this is called the Danish method of stitching. I learned this and I feel very, guys, look, loop again on the back, not a knot, loop, don't be afraid. Um, but completing individual cross stitches one at a time is technically the English method of cross stitching and completing in rows is the Danish method. Now this is something I found out from the internet. So take it with a grain of salt, but it sounds legit. And I saw it in a few different places. Aha, I de-looped my loop that had so cruelly looped. What happens if it knots? Oh, like I'm so you sorry. If you, don't catch it in time? if you don't catch it in time, it's probably going to get stuck on the back. And uh, what I would say is if you've got, gotten far enough, if you still have enough floss that you can keep stitching, there are times where I've just left it and I just have a little clump on the back. And sometimes you'll have like uh, loopies coming out from it because sometimes it, it'll like loop, 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 knot. And as long as that knot is like, you can use the loops of your stitching as you go to kind of flatten out those uh, stray loopies that happen. Uh, if it's really bad, you just sometimes need to cut, cut it. Um, and you'll have a, a stray floss tail that you just need to be mindful of when you continue stitching and make sure that you um, secure it down as you continue your stitching. Uh, and you just have to cut it, clean it up if you can, and um, you know, cl clean it up, clean up the problem. So I'm going to actually scooch this whole scenario a little bit so you can, I can sit a little closer. Everything can be a little closer and I don't have to lean. You can all see what I'm doing. So what I realize is when I stitch at a funny angle to make sure the camera can catch it, um, you can't see me very well. This tail on my needle is getting a little short for my liking. So I'm just gonna pull that through to give myself more slack and ensure that I'm not pulling anything through here. So I'm just gonna speed up my stitching a little bit by bringing my needle back through. So I'm not pulling each individual diagonal tight. I'm only pulling every other. There, I just stabbed through my Ada fabric in the wrong way. Uh, I did not stab through the hole. So you can see 
the threads were kind of splitting right there. So instead, I'm going to pause. I'm glad I caught it and readjust and make sure I get my needle right through the whole of the fabric. I just got a little over eager. Okay, so now we are moving up a row. Somebody asked about this. I can't remember the name who asked it. I'm so sorry, but somebody did ask about moving up a row. So we've completed a row, essentially. And to go up a row, as you can see on the pattern, we just move up, up one and over one is where the next stitch starts. So because I finished my stitch in the top left hole of this cross stitches, uh, construction, if you will. My next cross stitch starts just to the right. So I'm just going to bring my needle in directly up through the hole to the right and start my next diagonal. It's almost a little bit Pac-Man-esque. Like he, he gets the little bubbles in the middle and he goes up and he goes over the next row and then he goes up and over the next row. Uh, you just, you just work, work your way up as sequentially as you can. And if you get into a groove where your stitches are more or less uniform, you're sort of building them in a uniform way, um, it should be pretty, you'll find it gets more and more seamless uh, as you swap colors out or as you have to move up a row or down a row, you'll, you'll surprise yourself with how uh, systematized you can get with your stitching. And it's, you just get in a groove, you figure out a pattern that works for you and it'll, it'll surprise you like, oh, this is turning out really cleanly. Because if you look at the back, all of a sudden, my, my Watson pattern, uh, the backside is pretty uniform. It's not super messy. Just because I'm constructing, that's all that happens. Uh, some, some people have this old adage that if the back, is, the back needs to be as clean as the front. I do disagree with that. If the front is clean, be proud of your work, hang it up on the wall. But the whole idea behind that old adage is if the back of your work is clean, as clean as the front, it just means you're doing really consistent stitches. It's just a a, a very advanced litmus test of consistency, not necessarily skill, but consistency. So you can see even in my door that I made most of my stitches kind of the same way. That's why all of the backside stitches are all kind of vertically oriented. So now all I have to do is fix off John Watson's collar here. So this is just a diagonal stitch and there are no other colors. Um, it's just gray. It doesn't share a square with anybody. So I just do a half diagonal and I leave it. That's my preference. If you would like to fill in this white space, you can do a little corner uh, quarter stitch. You come up through the hole of the Ada fabric and poke your needle right through the middle to fill in that white space. But I have found through many, many stitch people portraits that uh, for me personally, just this one half diagonal, especially filling in these stitches on the inside with shirt design, uh, it'll look just fine. So how do we end? We're done with this gray part of Watson's suit. What do I do? I take my needle and I just run it through the back side stitches. This is like just the reverse of how we start. We start by holding the tail and creating loops out of nowhere to cover the tail. And now that we stitch, we have a bunch of loops and we can just run the, the ending tail, if you will, right through and we can cut it off real close and it is held down nice and tight. So now we're going to get into the territory that somebody asked at the beginning. How do you do those? Uh, how do you do those squares of color where it's like diagonally half one color and diagonally half another color? We are going to do that with John Watson's shirt. So tricky, tricky me making a really tricky pattern element right here. I'm going to get out my DMC Blanc floss. All of these DMC supplies you can get at Michaels or Michaels.com. Super. I just love DMC. I've always endorsed them because just as a personal advocate, because I, I, I love their floss. It's the best for me. So I'm, uh, I've got DMC Blanc floss. I'm splitting my six strands into three strands. I'm going to thread my needle. And on my pattern, you can see all I've got for the white stitches are just two little diagonals that are poking through his like red cravat, if you will. So what I'm going to do is just create white diagonals going the direction indicated on the pattern. So make sure you can see the pattern and my stitching at the same time. Perfect. 
So I'm going to bring my needle up. I'm going to catch the tail on the back with my finger. Oh, Spencer just found another light. Maybe it'll help. Okay, and I'm going to bring my needle down through that diagonal. And then I'm going to come back up through the same hole and I've still got my finger on that tail and I've created a loop now that will, it's gonna, well, I'm gonna pull it through the other direction just for security to secure itself onto there. And I'm gonna create uh, my second diagonal going the other direction. Now, again, if you wanted to create quarter stitches, you could, I'm not going to, and I'll show you why. Uh, this is one of the benefits that I really like three strands of floss for the Ada fabric instead of two, because three gives it just enough thickness that it, it fills out situations just like this in a really nice way. So I'm gonna clip that off. Gives it some body and volume. Gives it some body and volume. Geez, we could partner with Pantene Pro-V or something. Body and volume, that's true. That's exactly right. Thank you, Spencer. Says the, the bald guy. I guess, I don't know if you guys can hear him. He joked about body and volume. That's why I went with shampoo. Okay, so now I've got DMC 221 for Watson's vest or cravat, whatever you want to call that. So once again, I'm going to cut a length that's about broop, as long as my elbow or bicep, which are very strong, by the way. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> they used to be. I did a fitness competition once. I was ripped. It was nice. I miss it. It takes a lot to be a very strong person. A lot of consistency. So any of you who are very muscly, I respect the heck out of you. Okay, so I've got three strands of 221. I guess I sort of did that unnarrated. I clipped my bicep long length. I split the six strands into two groups of three, and now I'm threading my needle. And I'm going to start the same way that I have everything else. No knots, just holding the tail at the base of my needle. Is This is my favorite place to hold my needle, right here, because nothing's getting through. And I'm just gonna start at the base here because I like to work bottom to top if I can. And I'm gonna create the cravat, just cross stitches until I get to those diagonals. So I'm gonna have a tail, I'm gonna hold it with my finger. I'm gonna do my two diagonals. As I create the second diagonal, it makes a loop on the backside that I can use to secure my, my tail. Uh-oh, I, ha! I was not paying attention and I accidentally pressed my needle through my own floss. That's what that little knot is a result of. So before I get much farther, I'm telling you, today is the day for mistakes. I'm gonna unthread my needle just cause I happened to catch this in real time. And I'm going to pull out my stitch so it untangles from itself and will no longer do that. I'm gonna rethread it. Uh, while you're doing that, Leslie asks, why did you cut such a long length when you only have a handful of stitches? That's a really great question. Um, the honest answer is habit, um, just cause that's my go-to length. Uh, the other answer is workability. I do think there is a point where floss becomes a little short to work with it, like too long and it's cumbersome, too short as well and it's cumbersome. So that said, I probably could have done with half the length and still been just fine. Um, that's a good question though. If you cut a shorter length, Good for you for thinking ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just habit. Also, while you're uh, stitching, for those who didn't see in the first class, why do you load the hoop the way that you do? Oh, yes, that was my my Lizzie stitch hack of class number one. So you gotta come to all the classes, guys. There's gold nuggets to be had. Uh, the reason I do it this way, I'll pause stitching just to exemplify. Most embroidery hoops are utilized this way, where uh, the front of your finished work is on the quote unquote front of your hoop coming up and forward. The reason I load my hoop this way is because I'm a person who lives life and I touch my face and I get makeup on my fingertips and I pet my dogs and I inadvertently get dirt on my fingertips. And if I'm holding my work in an, an embroidery hoop like normal, if this is the front side of my fabric and I'm holding my hoop like this, my thumbs are getting put just life on the front of my fabric where my finished work also is. And when I undo this, there's gonna be some like little shadowies where my fingers have touched it. Versus if I hold it this way, um, I tend to work with my thumbs more and I just have my fingertips here like this. So all of the, all of the primary 
life that lives on my fingers, it's going to get on the backside of my portrait and whatever's on my thumbs is going to be on the outer edges in the part of my finished work that's not even going to show in a frame. So that's why I do that. The aquas, I'm just not very careful. I do wash my hands a lot. Like I'm not a disgusting person, but you guys know you get, you get life. Life happens. Even just like lotion, the oils from lotion that you forgot you put on your hands will get into the fabric and could slightly discolor it. Like you never know. Okay, so I'm gonna do these cross stitches and finishing these two cross stitches will bring me to the diagonals that share, share a square. They share a square with the white shirt floss. Now, if you look at the pattern, it is clear that the white diagonals should sort of lay on the inside I'm sorry, the red diagonals should lay on the inside of the white diagonals. The white diagonals represent the collar of a shirt that sits outside and the red diagonals represent the cravat that sits on the inside. So this is where I like to use my needle as a tool as much as a transportation device. That's what the word I was looking for earlier, a thread or floss transportation device. Um, what I mean by that is, if you look closely as I bring up my needle, I'm actually inside the white threads there. That's just where my needle naturally slips through. So what I'm gonna do is actually use my needle as a tool on the front side. I'm just gonna poke. I'm gonna sort of comb the threads up and I'm gonna poke and sort of prep this hole for my needle to come through it. And so by doing this and combing the threads aside, this way when I bring my needle up and through with the red floss, it's gonna sit under. Come on, there we go. It's gonna sit under those white threads. And now when I make my diagonal, which is exactly, it just shares the same hole as the white floss. If I pull that slowly, then I can use my needle as a tool and my fingernails as well, and just sort of negotiate the space there. And as I use my fingernail and the tip of my needle to separate the threads, and as I pull that diagonal tight, it helps them sit really nicely side by side. So now I'm gonna do the second diagonal, same thing, making sure that this red diagonal is gonna come through the inside underneath that white. And I'm pulling slow and loose so that here at the end, I can gather up that volume and body <laughs> of the white floss and pull it tight with my red floss. And it kind of just, sits real snug like in there you guys you ladies you men and women and all you i keep saying guys i'm trying to get away from the you guys phrase i so i keep catching myself guys ladies gentlemen boys and girls and then this is just personal preference you don't have to do it i'm just going to do one straight stitch up the middle to sort of fill out that triangle shape and now i've got this cutie cute little outfit i don't know why it's so dark but i think you can see I will actually hold it up to my other camera. Let me just see if that will help. Hello, maybe this will do it. Whoop. Yeah, it's a, well, it's a little bit different. You can see the crispy uh, triangle that the red floss has created sitting just inside the white floss uh, because of using my needle and fingernails as tools to help me get those flosses sitting really nicely together side by side. So I'm gonna transition back to my stitching. So now what do I do? I'm done with the red floss, great. I'm just going to uh, find a nice grouping of stitches on the back side to thread my needle and floss through, just sort of skim, skim it across the top there. And I can tell as I pull on these little tails that they're all nice and secure. So I'm gonna cut them. If they weren't secure, I'd leave a little length so I could adjust it if it got loose, but. I don't think that's going to happen It's because how secure they are. So I just cut them real tight and now we've got Watson's whole base ready to go. So with our last 10 minutes, what I'd like to do, I think actually that'll be just enough time to stitch Watson's skin tone. So I've got DMC 945. We do have a bit of area to cover with his head bigger than the suit. So this uh, bicep length of floss is gonna be a little more justified. That was a really good question. Like, why did you use so much? Just because I, wasn't thinking, uh. <laughs> that's okay. 
and he now says, yeah where watson's skin meets his hat looks really tricky uh -huh. aha really yep so um one yeah. quick question. Is there a reason why you wouldn't think about the layers and do the red first of the cravat and then the white? Is there hmm. a reason to do the white before the red? That's a really insightful question. And I will say that oftentimes I do think through layers. Uh, like, just like if you look at the pattern here, the plant clearly sits quote unquote, above or in front of the door. So it makes sense to do the door and stairs first and we'll do the plant later like that's a very clear one um so that's what i mean by like layers like what is visually sitting in front of something else um in this particular case it really could have gone either way i think i just wanted to get those little white stitches out of the way um so i just did them uh you could i think that's a case where you really could do it either way especially because those stitches are, are meant to sit side by side um and I could see a scenario where the collar sort of comes over that vesti cravat tie thing. So you'd want the white sort of an over situation. I'd also see a situation where you put on the collar and then you put on a cravat and the cravat kind of spills out and covers the collar. So that I think is just personal preference. Um, what I'm going to do now is I've got three strands of DMC 945. I'm going to start uh, just at the bottom right of Watson's head, or I could start on the left side, just start wherever you'd like. I'm just going to choose this corner here and I'm going to make sure you see the pattern and my stitching if I can and just double check my pattern. I think that's my first stitch. That's where he goes. We're just going to start and kind of zoom through his face. Oh, I transitioned by accident. Hi, everybody. Sorry. There we go. So somebody mentioned the uh, the stitches underneath his hat. And this is, the reason it's designed that way is because this is full disclosure, I am persnickety. That's the only reason why. Uh, doing a bowler hat on, as I was designing that on John, um, every design I came up with did not look quite right until I let the bowler hat scoop down ever so slightly. Going straight across, it didn't look right. It looked like a cowboy hat. So what I did, like I mentioned uh, uh, to those of you who were in last week's class and remember, I'm basically self-taught. Like I learned the basics when I was a kid of cross-stitching. Um, but then when I picked it back up in my 20s, I, I just figured it out again. And, and in designing patterns, nobody taught me how to do that. And so I just figured it out. And so I've put a lot of design elements into my Stitch People patterns that are less than traditional um, and throw people off sometimes because it's just like my brain manifesting to your Ada fabric. You are welcome. Um, and it results in things exactly like this in this pattern, like these funky little half stitches. I will just say in advance, and what I'm going to do is kind of work up there as fast as I can. Um, they can, you can complete them in two ways. You can do, let me get a pencil. What you can do, most cross stitches take up a full square like this, right? Do, 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 dunzo. We've got a cross stitch. With these half stitches, what you can do is two things. You can either just do straight stitches and the three threads of floss in each of the colors will fill in that square nicely. And you can just do kind of a running stitch and just do straight stitches. Or you can do like squatty cross stitches and go a little bit outside the holes of the Ada fabric. So you can do in these squares, a skin tone color like this and then a gray color like that. And that's what I'm gonna do just to keep the more consistent uh, texture of a cross stitch instead of this. But if that makes you a little nervous, don't do it and do uh, just straight acrosses. So once I finish this chin row, cause I wanna make sure I hit this in my last five minutes. I'm just gonna skip up to the forehead row. <laughs> and bust it out with you. Whoever pointed that out, thank you for reminding me because I wouldn't have thought twice, but it is a little bit uncouth. So I know there are a lot of people who are traditional stitchers and have been doing this for far longer than I have who see my patterns and shake their fist at me because what the heck am I doing? I'm sorry, thank you for being patient. It makes for cool patterns though. <laughs> so I'm just going to, for the sake of uh, instruction here, um, first of all, this is a really funky little uh, square right here. I'm just going to complete a full cross stitch of skin tone color here 
And when I make my tiny little diagonal, the diagonal goes from the top right corner of this particular strip stitch just to the middle of the left edge. So it's just a tiny little diagonal, but I don't wanna try and jerry rig, gerrymander, I always get those words confused, this uh, skin tone, you know, what the heck shape is that? I don't know, I'm just gonna do a full cross stitch is what I'm getting at. So up from the chin and over one. So we're gonna go one, two, three, four rows up and one stitch over. One, two, three, four rows up and one stitch over is going to be just a full skin tone cross stitch, which I'll just do a little gray diagonal over top it when I get there. And this is again, a great example too of, I generally start with the skin tone on Stitch People characters first because hair kind of goes on top, hats go on top. I'd rather have eyes coming forward instead of being sunken back because stitches are around it or tamping it down because I did the eyes first. So this is a case where, you know, when somebody said, oh, why did you do the white first and not the red first? This is a case where I do like to do the skin tone first because I don't want um, other elements to get hidden when they should be on top. So now I'm going to do these funky little squatty cross stitches like I drew out here. Yeah, Spence, you want to give me a good zoom? Okay. I'm using the bottom corners of the Ada fabric and I'm, this is why I like an embroidery needle. I'm just gonna poke that through the middle. And these I'm just gonna complete fully as I go. Like I said, I usually stitch in rows, but I generally use both methods of stitching as needed. So now I'm gonna do the next one. Bottom left corner of the full square to the middle of the right edge. You can kind of see the eight of threads separating there. I'm just gonna poke that through, make it work for me. This is the shape I need, so this is the shape I'm making. And then we come back up and then poke through that left edge. Bottom left corner, I've already done that hole. Bottom right corner, oops, there we go. Poke through the left edge right between the holes of the Ada fabric. And it's gonna look funky at first because we don't have the hat, but once you do this exact same stitch right above it in the gray, you'll see that it's just the most subtle difference, a half a row of these squatty stitches versus full cross stitches. But oh my goodness, it makes such a difference in the overall design to just help the curvature of the hat be a little bit truer to life. And we've got just two minutes left, which is very cool. We are timing it out just right. While I finish this up, we have one more half stitch, half, half height stitch, and one more full cross stitch on the other side. Uh, what I, I, I'm deciding in this moment, I am gonna do another bonus video. So keep an eye on our social media over the next few days. I'm gonna record another bonus video instructing how to finish John Watson. And I'm also going to, if you guys will do this, uh, you, folks, if you folks will do this as well, I'm going to stitch the blue window of 220, underneath 221B. And we'll start with doing um, the 221B straight stitch text tomorrow, tomorrow, next week. So I'll do a stitch along video on how to finish Watson and doing this window. And the next, next week we'll jump into Sherlock. We're gonna tackle French knots. Uh, we're gonna tackle a whole bunch of fun things. So French knots, straight stitches. We're gonna talk about how to do the plaid on Sherlock Holmes hat. So, oh, I'm redoing a stitch that I already did. So I'm gonna undo that and move on to my final cross stitch. There we go. So just a reminder, head to stitchpeople.com slash week three and stitchpeople.com slash week four to get signed up for next week's class and our uh, week four class as well. And keep an eye on our social media for the bonus video to finish John Watson and finish the window so that we can all be on the same page as we work on our stitch along next week. Um, we're gonna go over French knots. We're gonna go over more uses of straight stitches. Uh, we're gonna use it in John Watson's mustache and talk about kind of getting more realistic look for hair. We're gonna go over lazy daisy stitches in week four and how to utilize slightly more advanced but not too advanced embroidery stitches to judge your portraits and cross stitch works. So uh, stick with us, come next week, sign up and post your 
uh, updates along the way on social media, hashtag make it with Michaels, hashtag stitch people and hashtag DMC. And we will see you at 2 p.m. Mountain time next Thursday. Thank you everybody so much for joining us. It's always a pleasure and uh, we will see you next week. Bye-bye.